David asked me to come up and share some of the research that we have on company growth and some growth in the economy stuff to bust some myths, as he said, and about company growth, which we're going to do. We're going to look at five different myths and see if the data backs them up. These are going to be myths that maybe you've heard of in the past or, or you think you hold those myths, um, and we'll see whether, whether or not they're, they're true or not. We're going to go from a high level and then down inside the company, and hopefully at the end, my goal is to give you one that you can take with your team to lunch and, or dinner, and you can say, hey, are we doing this? Do we need to be doing this better? So we want to get to a point where it's really practical, but we're going to start at, at a higher level. So, oh, and by the way, there's about 50 or so folks out here doing the uh, training series with us. Hello, everybody. And, uh, and uh, so you're going to have probably seen some of this material during the training, but different context. So uh, bear with us here as we, as we move through. So I wanted to start off and give you just a little, a little bit of a backstory, and primarily so you don't think that I've um, always been sort of an economist nerd my whole life. Maybe the nerd part, but not necessarily the economist part. So um, at the end of the 90s, the beginning of the 2000s, I'm over in Europe. I've got a business of my own over in Holland in Rotterdam. And uh, we're working with companies to help them expand abroad. So we're doing market research, helping to find agents and distributors, doing foreign investment projects. Um, and I had previously been working at KPMG, and I won a contract with the state of Maryland to go over to Europe to um, start their office and to attract investment in and help their companies export. And as soon as I got over there, I won the contract from the city of Rotterdam, the largest port in the world, to represent them in North America. So I put together uh, a little team for that. We can see over here, this is Mayor Paper from uh, Rotterdam and Secretary of Commerce from the state of Maryland doing our ribbon cutting on the office. And here's our first team here, and the nerd in the middle is me. Yeah, OK. And uh, since, we're all, uh, since we're all sort of team oriented here today, I, I wanted to show you this picture. Um, our team had really just gone through something that was really challenging. It was really hard, and they did an exceptional job. So there's this little town that I love in Holland named Brilla. And so I invited them all over, and uh, they showed up, and I gave them bikes in this, this puzzle. And the puzzle was all around town. They had to go on their bikes around town and find all these pieces, and we had lunch. And at lunch, I gave them all a packet of 1,000 euros each, and I told them they had two hours to spend it. And if they didn't spend it, I was going to take it back. So they went on the shopping spree, and it was a blast. They were like singing and dancing, and they, they bought all this stuff and just had the greatest time. And it just reinforced to me how important the teams are and team morale and te team culture is. And it was just really a special team and um, very international team, by the way. We had Cameroon, Germans. We had folks from um, Romania, uh, French. British, we had folks in London, Paris, and Baltimore. So it was, a, it was a great time to be over there. Anyway, getting back to the story, sorry about that, is that we were over there doing all this work. Um, some clients like Lockheed Martin, Gene Logic, um, the now deceased CompUSA, would hire us directly to work with them, but the rest of the work was, within, was with middle market companies helping them expand abroad on behalf of economic development agencies because it creates jobs and, and investment. And most of the economic development agencies across the country then and still now to a large degree followed this theory that's usually, um, usually attributed back to Michael Porter at the Harvard, um, Harvard University, um, the industry cluster theory which is most of the growth in the economy is attributable to industry clusters, which are companies located in dense urban areas, so they have access to skilled workers, capital, suppliers, et cetera, and they're in knowledge-intensive industries, like software and biotech. And that's where all the growth in the economy 
comes from, right? And that's true here, right? Because you're all biotechnology companies from Boston, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So it didn't, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me either, but that's, that's, um, that's what they thought. And so we were over there, we were over there trying to attract businesses um, at the point where there's a narrow window between the time that they decide that they want to open a new facility in the United States or in Europe, um, and you have to get to them in that really narrow window. Now, it's really hard to do, actually. It, it, it really is hard to identify those companies because they don't raise their hand, so you have to find them, right? So the economic development agencies were all telling us, you know, go for the industry clusters, and we tried that. We tried that for a number of years, and we were getting one investment project a year. Not really great. That's not really, they didn't think that's what they were paying me for. So, uh, and I was doing 120 uh, foreign direct investment meetings a year. I was doing a lot of, a lot of meetings on it. Um, so what I thought, after seeing over 400 companies expand, it wasn't industry size or location, it was that the companies already had a track record of growth. That past performance in some ways predicted future performance. So I wanted to test it out. I went to the Chambers of Commerce in Europe are really cool because they have individual company records and they're public, whereas Michael Porter and almost all the academics over in the United States, they use federal government data. They have, the government has individual company records, but they don't release that. They aggregate that data. They aggregate it in three ways and they release that data by industry, size, and location. So is it any coincidence that that's what the theories are built on, industry, size, and location? So if you get firm level data, and you can actually look at firm performance, then you can start separating the sheep from the goats, right, based on performance, and then look at how are these companies that are really performing well similar to each other, and how are they different from all the other companies in the economy? So I didn't, I, I saw that, and I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing before with the industry clusters, so we started to track company growth, and we started to win projects. And we went from an average of one project a year to eight projects a year. And those were big projects. I mean, we had some big, big projects that we won. And um, so it sort of reinforced to me that this was the right track, but it was completely against the theory and practice and economic development and also in a lot of uh, investment in the investment world as well. So I was, after a couple of years there, I was over there for a decade, I kind of got to the flat part of my learning curve and I'm not so good when I'm on a flat part of my learning curve, I need a challenge. So I wrapped up my operation over there and I came back to get a, a PhD so that I could get the economics and statistics so I could try to test this theory and that's, that's what I did. I was very fortunate that I hooked up early with a colleague from University of Wisconsin in Madison where I was senior research fellow. And we built this data set in the United States, the first one and only one of its kind, where we could track every single company in the economy. Public companies, private companies, and nonprofit. And we could track them in a time series. So we could tell how they were changing over time where they were born, where they moved, what their employment was over time, what their sales and estimated sales, we didn't have the actual sales, how that changed over time, ownership, minority owned, women owned, if they were government contractors, exporters, we had 100 variables on every single company in the country. And from that, we could really separate the sheep from the goats across the United States. And what it really revealed to us on the first pass is that it didn't have anything to do really with industry size and location. Yeah. So we showed that, I showed that to the, um, the governor's staff in Pennsylvania and Virginia and they gave us a contract to go out and survey and do focus groups and case studies on 5,000 companies. We focused on the, the CEOs and founders. 
to test whether or not they were doing things differently, fundamentally differently than the other, the other companies. Yeah? And we found a whole lot of stuff. And we found 50 things that they do differently, and that's in the training series. I'm not going to go deep in that. We'll talk about one of those. At, well, we'll talk about two of them as we go through, and, and one really important one at the very end. But the other thing that we found, which was kind of counterintuitive in a way, was that all growth is not good. There's good growth, and then there's incredibly destructive growth. And that's, that's kind of where we want to go today in our discussion. So let's get to the first one. <clears throat> so rising tide lifts all, lifts all ships or all boats, right? Most companies grow when the, when the economy grows. Now, that would seem to be a reasonable assumption, right? When the economy is growing, most, most companies benefit. Why not? All right, so I'm going to nerd out here a little bit on statistics and economics, so follow me. I'll try not to go too, too far overboard on this. Okay, so we have all the companies in the economy over a five-year period of time. Yeah, we're measuring their sustained growth. I'll tell you how we do that in a minute. You add all the bars up, gets to 100%, so that's a percentage by category here. So you take, you take five years for every company in the economy, Oh, and we're looking at survivors only, okay? So we want apples to apples comparison. We're not including the companies that were born or died during the five-year period of time. So the ones that went, and, and what you're seeing here is about nine million companies, okay? So on a five-year five period of time. So we take each year, if the company grew, doesn't matter how much, we give them a one. If they stayed the same, we give them a zero. And if they declined, doesn't matter how much, we give them a zero, as long, uh, minus one as long as they didn't die, right? So one if they grew, zero if they didn't, minus one if they shrank. Then we sum them together, it gives us an 11 point scale, they shrank every year, they grew every year, they ain't did nothing. And when we look at this, we go, holy moly. Now, if you're a, statist if you're a statistics guy, one of the first things that you'd notice on this is that it's not a bell curve, it's not a Gaussian curve. If it's a bell curve, that means that the underlying process that generates these outcomes is random. That means that you know you and your competitor and anybody down the street is just random whether or not you grow or not. But what we see up here is called a Laplace distribution or a power law. Maybe some of you have heard of power laws before, which tells us a couple of things. One, it's a scale invariant distribution. So we got 73% of the companies in the economy did nothing over that five years. One seventh of them did one year net. One seventh of that, two years. One seventh of that, three years. There are bars over here. They're just too small for you to see at this scale. Um, so why is that important? Well, the opposite of a random event is a, syst a systematic event, right? That means that there's an underlying system that causes a distribution like this. By the way, if you take internet hits on websites, it's this distribution. If you take incomes of professional basketball players, it's this distribution. If you used to, if you took uh, record sales, if you take market share, if you take trading volumes, it's this way. Yeah, because there's a systematic process underneath that that generates this distribution. So the question becomes, of course, what is that? And that's where all the case studies and focus groups, what is that? But when we get here, we say, okay, that means that a small group here is responsible for the vast majority of the outcomes of that system. That's the question. How do they do that? But what are the outcomes of this? How can we measure the outcome of this growth distribution? So one way we can do is look at employment change. So remember, we were looking at a period that was growth or, st or stable. So we're going to look at the 2015 to 2000 period. Yeah. So we got about 8.6 million companies in the entire economy that we're measuring during that period that were survival survivors. Of that, 120,000 were sustained growth companies. Now I define sustained growth. You sort of think, you know, what would be the minimum definition of sustained? It would be like two or more, right? So it's just a definition, just two or more, right? So what you find is that's only 
That's only 1% of the company to grow two or more on a net basis over a five-year period of time. Surprise, that, that's a big surprise for a lot of people, particularly if you go show that to a governor. That's a big damn surprise. <laughs> so those companies all together, they created 7.6 million jobs over that period of time. Sustained growth companies, 2.5 million, or 34% of all the jobs. Now, I want you to trip on that for a minute. One one hundredth of the companies created one third of all the jobs. Yeah? <laughs> That's leverage, man. That's leverage, right? If you get more companies to do that, think what happens to your economy, right? That's huge. So, but it really does, it really tells us something up here. So if we look at that, most companies grow when the economy grows. That's bullshit. Really, you know, <laughs> we see that 73% just stagnate. Yeah? There's only 1% of the companies on a net basis are growing two, two or more of the years out of five. Right? There's really, really exceptional companies. So what's next? So that was rising tide. All ships go up. No, the tide comes down. We expect all the ships to come down, right? That's what we would expect. So let's take a look at a period of decline volatility, 2010, 2015. We got nearly 9 million companies in the economy, 75,000 sustained growers. Again, it's 1%. It's a scale invariant distribution. It doesn't matter exactly when we measure it. It's always 1%. It just always seems to be 1%. Now, all of the companies, 100% of the companies, create a million jobs. Sustained growth companies create 1.4 million, almost one and a half million jobs. Now, now, how's, now how's, that, how's that possible? How does 1% one, how does 1 create more than the total? That's because the other 99% lost half a million jobs. And this sustained growth group here is backfilling for the loss of the other 99%. So you got 1% of, of companies, 142% of the, the jobs. <laughs> that's, that's pretty exciting, guys. That's, that's, I want to be in that 1%. How about you? <laughs> so that's also bullshit. All companies suffer during economic downturns. The 1%. With sustained growth, they thrive and they dominate regardless of the economic conditions. <sighs> really? How does, that, how does that happen? Well, um, we're going to get to an answer on that. So the first one we want to look at is fast growth is good. It's best. I mean, we're told this all the time, right? We, we read um, Fast Company, right? We read... Inc. Magazine, I was the economist at Inc. Magazine for three years, by the way. Um, uh, we, we, we hear from venture capital folks, right? Grow, grow, grow. Profits, don't worry about that. Just grow, just grow, right? That's, it's all about fast growth, right? So that's, that's, what we've, that's what we've got to get. So is that true? We're going to use a little, little bit of a model on this. Okay, so... You've all heard that, at the macro level anyway, that supply equals demand, right? You've heard of that sort of equilibrium model, right? right? So let's look at a micro level. Let's look at the company level and think, what does that mean really at the company level? So we could have capacity as your supply. This could be the number of people, how much you can put out of the factory, whatever. And we'll say sales, really potential sales, is demand. So we got supply demand here, right? And the way that you sort of expand capacity, so usually it's stepwise. So we got our employees. Uh, now it's time to expand. We'll hire some more. And we'll go for a little while. And then we build another line and build a warehouse. So that's what we're doing here. We're trying to you know, kind of chase the demand up here. But demand, your, your actual demand is yeah, it's kind of unpredictable because there's all these things that could happen, you know, the government, COVID, you know, um, all these macro things. So you can do a great forecast, but there's always a bit of variance there. So it's not perfect, right? So a lot of times you're, yeah, you don't quite have enough capacity to, to satisfy. You know, it's a bit of an opportunity cost, but it's not killing you, you know? I mean, it's, you know, you really wish you could. So you're ramping up, you're ramping up, you're ramping up. You get up here, and you got a little bit of overcapacity when the market softens. And at this point, 
it's still, it's manageable. Now, I did a project for GE Capital where um, we looked at um, the, the companies that were the, in the best position to go into the 2009 recession that did best during the 2009 recession and then were the fastest to emerge out of the, the 09 recession. Anybody want to guess who those companies were? <laughs> it was the 1%. Yeah, you got it. Sustained growth companies, right? So what we found is that sustained growth companies were significantly more likely to move faster when they, they saw that there was a challenge to adjust their capacity really quickly, faster than in the other companies, so it didn't kill them, right? They make the, make the adjustment, and they were also the fastest to recognize when the market was just about to pick back up so they would start adding capacity back in. So the, the, the lesson of this is that, you know, on a micro level, you want your supply to equal demand. And if you're in the 1%, you're better off at doing that. But the whole goal is to try to make these incremental moves. Now, the higher that this line is, the more you move up, that sort of represents a higher percentage of growth, right? So it's a higher percent of growth. So what happens when you really ramp that up? Let's say we go out and we take one of these government subsidized loans to expand our facility, or we just borrow from the bank, or we go to another part and we just add on debt. Well, we radically increase our probability that we're gonna overshoot our demand, right? We do, I mean, we do. You increase the probability that you're gonna get in trouble by Overbuilding, it's pretty intuitive when you really think about it that way, right? Now, if it's backed by debt, we've known for a long, long time that the more debt you have, the more leverage you are, the more likely you are to collapse. And it's true in our data as well, across the board, right? Because you get to that point and you're stuck. You still gotta pay for it, you know? You can't, you've lost that flexibility to move, right? So, Really, that's telling us um, that fast growth is best is false. And if you're doing it in such a way that you have a real high percentage of growth all at once, you're more likely to overshoot your demand, particularly if you funded it with debt, you've radically increased the probability that your firm will collapse. It's proven. It's the fact. That's why we see sustained growth companies are far more likely than other companies to fund their growth through earnings and not debt. So, again, I guess Silicon Valley and a lot of, a lot of, these, of these places out there, they think that the visionary leader is the key to growth. We, get, we gotta have a, a visionary leader who can see tomorrow. He will take us in, she will take us into tomorrow. Is that, is that true? So <clears throat> the literature sort of describes um, two sort of archetypes. And you can think these, of these as sort of like you know, perfect examples on a continuum uh, that are out there. Nobody's exactly like this. But you know, as you go through here, sort of think, you know, am, I like, am I like this one? Am I like that one? You know, is my boss like that? And, and don't look at them when you think that, OK? Because they'll know <laughs> that you're thinking that, OK? So. <clears throat> So the first one is the managerial style. So this is actually the most common one. These are folks that have come up into a functional discipline. You know, I'm the marketing and sales person, and I've been that way all the way for the rest of my life, and I'm now on the executive team, and this is, this is my area. Stay out. You know, we know this. We know this. There's a few of you here. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. So these folks, they, they tend to, the mindset really is, is control. It's trying to reduce the variance, trying to make sure that everybody's following procedures. And the problem that we get on that is that innovation really and trial and error is about variance, yeah? If you think about it, people have got to have a little bit of leeway so they can try new approaches that are better than what they've been doing in the past. And if you have a managerial approach, it comes at the cost of too much SOPs, too much control, reduces that scope of innovation. The visionary leader, 
over here, right, the hero of our story is usually a founder or an outsider. He's got the long-term view, and, you know, they're, they're looking at the trends. They're, you know, they're, it's all about uh, change, non-linearity, so it's unpredictable what the future's going to be. They're looking at the forecast analogies, you know, tomorrow's going to be like this and like that, you know, that sort of thing. The problem is, and there's been a lot of work on this, is that companies that are really heavy on this run a much bigger chance of getting into financial problems in the short term because they're just not really focused on the short term. They're all looking out a little bit too far in the future. So what did our research find when we were surveying all these CEOs and founders? We saw a different style. We saw what sort of we would classify as a strategic side. These were the kind of leaders that had been, in one way or another, exposed to different parts of the organization, cross-training, or really just good communications with the other parts of the organization. And they had a really good picture, even at the executive level and even, even below that, of the way the whole enterprise worked, not just their functional area. And they were good at understanding how their functional area worked, and they understood you know, the practices of standard operating procedures and things like that. But they wanted people to experiment. They wanted them to experiment as long as what they were experimenting with and the kind of local decisions that they were making was in line with the vision, the plan, and the targets of the firm. So that ends up being the touchstone. That's the touchstone for whether or not that creative approach that you're taking is really worth it or not. Yeah, maybe a good idea, it may sound good, but if it's not in alignment with this other, then it's, it's not helpful for us, right? So their, their power derives from making sure that the people that they work with, particularly below them, understand that, and they're given the license to do that but only within that scope. So we look at that one. Growth is driven by visionary leaders. False. Strategic leaders empower teams to drive growth. Well, we just talked about the vision, plan, and target. So it must be true, then, that superior performance is driven by a superior vision, plan, and target. That's what we, what we just said, right? So um, what we find is that most companies that are, that are here and the sustained growth companies, a lot of them, they do an excellent job creating that and then that from that and that from that. And they believe in decentralization and they put a you know, structure in place to support that with um, the intention and that's going to create sustained or paced growth. But in practice, we're missing something. And this is what I want you to think about with, with, with your teams uh, at lunch or, or this afternoon, is that um, it's the difference between an assumption and a determined effort. It may look soft to you, but it makes all of the difference in the world. That's actually communicating that vision, plan, and target down into the corporation into the company, all the way down so that everybody understands it, yeah? And it's, it's doing that in a way that's very clear and very concise. It doesn't have to be the same message to everybody in the company in detail, yeah? Because different people are responsible for different things, so the application of a target to operations may be different than the application of that target to marketing, for instance. But everybody has got to understand the vision, and they've got to understand why we're getting there and, and, and how we're going to try to get there as a, as a company. So that's got to be communicated frequently, frequently, like just about every opportunity you can, you know, even like putting it on your coffee mug. You know, I mean, it's like putting that message out there and indoctrinating the new people you hire into that company culture about what you're about and what you, what you want to do as you want to move forward. And that's really what we found that makes the difference between having all the, all the rest of it and really having it work to your advantage for pace growth. 
So we find that superior vision plan and target is necessary, but it's, it's not completely sufficient. We've got to have that communication, that clear, concise, frequent, and deep communication of those throughout the organization. And that is a way you think about how much does it cost to do that? And compare that to the cost of other initiatives you think are going to grow your company. How much leverage do you think that that will have for the, for the dollar you put in it? It's huge. It's huge. So this is where we are. Only 1% of the companies grow two to five years. The 1% thrive during all sorts of economic conditions. Fast growth, if we overshoot our demand and we're funding it through debt, is really <laughs> bad for your health. All right? Strategic leaders are the ones that really drive performance. They do that through their teams by taking the vision, the plan, and the targets and making sure everybody understands that and managing on that. Leadership into that and managing on that. The great news is that you're all in the 1%. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, there you go, you are. That's fantastic. You had to be, because Dave wouldn't have let you in this room if you weren't, <laughs> right? But you may be only the two out of the five years part of it. And we certainly would like you to be the three, four, and five out of five years part. So what we're hoping is through the content that you receive today, tomorrow, et cetera, and through the relationships that you create with your colleagues, but also with all the other companies here, remember one thing. You're more alike, regardless of your industry size and location, than you are different. So get to know the person next to you. Thanks very much.